Hi, we're the Chris's, and this is Achieving Healthy Multiplicity, the case for five steps. In our 33 years of knowing that we're plural, we have gone through different phases of our own recovery. We didn't feel particularly pressured from the get-go to work on trauma. Not to say we weren't traumatized, we just, we had no idea really how deep it went, and we had no particular inclination to go digging around and finding out. We found out we were plural at 16, and we were inpatient for nine months, but not in a trauma recovery program. We're just in an adolescent unit on a private mental hospital, which was okay. It was more like a country club than a hospital setting, but we had therapy <laughs> instead of tennis, I guess. <laughs> And for us, that nine months was the first time we actually felt safe and pretty comfortable with who we were with. We kind of felt like we understood the people on the unit with different mental health issues and substance abuse issues. We understood them better than we understood people outside of that environment. When we left the hospital, we were outpatient for a few years with decreasing frequency of appointments. So it was like maybe twice a week and then once a week and then every other week and so on. This was out on Long Island. So it was a couple of hours trip to go to therapy. It was not easy. We were living in Brooklyn and going out to Long Island. It would take all afternoon. So we worked it around our school schedule uh, or worked our school schedule around needing to have appointments with our therapist. We worked part-time. And one might say that's kind of healthy multiplicity enough. You know, there's no such thing as perfect. Perfect is a goal, not a not a destination. <laughs> so we didn't behave perfectly. We didn't navigate life very well. Overall, if, you know, if we nitpicked, we'd find lots of things that could have been better. But we held down a job. We We lived. We could go on public transportation and go see our therapist. And we had some interpersonal relationship issues. And then we stumbled on self-help books. We fixed some of our interpersonal issues and some of our mood swing issues using some of that BPD work back then. That was one of the first self-help journeys that we went through. It was a lot of introspection. It was a lot of coping mechanisms and really a lot of noticing what we were thinking and how we got ourselves into so those negative thought spirals that we would get with the BPD. We started working on our own at that point. That was... You know, well, we kind of already knew our work wasn't done, that we still had a lot of tweaks to do in terms of personal growth or becoming a more healthy multiple. We didn't have tools. And once we discovered self help and self improvement books and recovery books, it was like a whole new world opened up to us. We set aside fiction and fantasy. We stopped playing DD. We went into the bookstores and we, we started getting some of these self help books. And then we got into the recovery books, which was really trauma work. So somewhere along the way, we became self-empowered. We became independent of our therapist. We never longer, after that first book, we didn't pick up the phone and call. We did a lot of soul searching. We worked a lot on internal community and we changed a lot of our headspace and so on. And then the internet (laughs) And that's when we really started doing massive moving mountains kind of self-work and trauma work. And and we achieved what we would call healthy multiplicity, even though we had not worked on all of our traumas or all of our triggers. But we were able to hold down jobs for quite a while. So from, from 87 to 97. And then Due to illness, due to the toxicity of the work environment, we quit when we were four months pregnant with our second child. We were working in pre-press, so we were working with film and developer and formaldehyde. There were printers that were leaking toner, so whatever the heavy metals were in the toner, we started getting really sick and we were pregnant. So our partner said, that's it, stay home. We did for seven years. We lost a lot of weight, both during and after the pregnancy. We didn't gain weight in that pregnancy. We lost weight. Uh, We were really not well. And eventually we, we recovered and we used the time off to work on more mental health stuff. We worked more on trauma. We found subsystems and, and so on. So 
that was really a big change from working and doing the work to 100% doing the work full time on our own and with a couple of friends. So to us, healthy multiplicity meant being able to pursue the things we wanted to do. We wanted to work. You know, we liked working. We, we chose places to work and, and usually part-time jobs, but we chose places to work. We liked working and we liked supporting our family. These were our choices. If somebody was to look at our resume, it would show. So through that time, through that 10 years, in 2001, so it was a little more than 10 years, we became an empowered consumer of our own health, basically, an empowered client. We went back to our therapist. We wanted some help with some stuff in 2001. That didn't work out. We were going to try and find a DID specialist. That wasn't going to work out with our health insurance at the time. Uh, or it wasn't easy to find someone called the insurance company. And they're like, what? <laughs> we couldn't find a DID specialist. And we didn't think to ask for a trauma specialist. Nobody told us that there was another category to look for. So because of this, we just gave up, we stopped looking, and we went back to working on ourselves. So fast forward to now, we choose to work on our trauma when we choose to work on it, and we have chosen a therapist to help us work on trauma because we've chosen not to work on it and on our own, not because we couldn't, but we did get stuck and have some trouble with some of our, especially somatic triggers, the physical, like smells, touch and things like that, that we wanted to work on. So we decided to go back to therapy and find someone to help us with that. But we walk into the office with our power and not handing our power over. So we want to make the case for five steps, given all of our experience and the things we hear from people, all the studying we've done on the side, reading books and papers, research papers and dissertations and talking in forums with other plurals and knowing so many plural people, because throughout all those years, we've always met plural people everywhere we went. Knowing all these plural people, having done self-work with plurals and talking to plurals about it, we think that there's some steps missing in the three-step model. McLean Hospital in the Massachusetts area was presenting at the Healing Together conference and said that 90% of therapists don't know what to do with DID. They pointed out the problem that many DID patients are going into therapy and having to train their therapists. Obviously, it's a problem that the therapeutic time is being taken up with training the therapist and talking to the therapist about techniques and what needs to be done versus actually doing therapy. And this happens because of therapy deserts. Sometimes you live in an area where there is only one therapist, or there's very few, and there's no specialists. So you can walk into an office, because it's within, let's say, an hour of your home. You can walk into an office, and they know nothing. So across the United States, there's even places where there are no therapists at all, or where the only therapist in town doesn't believe in DID. And so now you're kind of stuck with somebody who refuses to treat you or just thinks you're malingering or factitious disorder and so on. So of those 90% who are floating in the ignorance area, ignorance or even just outright hostility, what is the client supposed to do? Like how those, those that are willing to learn, what should the client do to help them learn? Somebody asks McLean Hospital, you know, what resources or materials, what, is there a good book or something I should refer my therapist to? And McLean Hospital says the ISSTD guidelines. They refer people to them as the quote-unquote best resource. And many of us know this. Many people with DID know about the ISSTD guidelines. We read them. Some of us even comprehend them, even though they're written kind of highbrow. It's the ISSTD 2011 Guidelines for Treating DID in Adults, third revision, uh, and it was published in January 2012 in Psychological Trauma Theory Research Practice and Policy. Shortly after they were working on the ISSTD guidelines, which were available online uh, in December 2011, while they were working on it and right after they were working on it, there was a survey that was done of 36 experienced, I'd say, specialists in DID. 
and that's called A Survey of Practices and Recommended Treatment Interventions Among Expert Therapists Treating Patients with DID and DDNOS. At the time, it was DDNOS. So this was during DSM-4-TR. So the, the survey is by Brand, Merrick, Lowenstein, Klassen, Lanius, McNary, Payne, and Putnam. So I refer to it as Brand 2012, and it actually has as one of its references the ISSTD guidelines from 2011. So the Brand 2012 study, or survey really, is assessing the techniques and the mindset of basically the ISSTD 2011 authors and their actual practices, or 12 of them anyway. I don't know how many people are on the team for the ISSTD guidelines, but 12 of them are represented in the Brand 2012 study. The treatment guidelines themselves, ISSTD 2011 guidelines, so they were first created, the first revision was several years before, and then it was revised, and then it was revised again in 2011, according to this open-ended membership survey. So not everybody giving input was necessarily an expert such as those in the survey. The people in the survey had been treating people with DID for nine plus years. They kind of made the guidelines and then did a survey of the quote unquote top experts. But the top experts are a biased closed group. So that's kind of problematic. 36 therapists, 12 of whom wrote the guidelines. The other 24 were selected either by those 12 you know, as, as a recommendation to the survey, or the people who wrote it, Brand, Merrick, Lowenstein, Klassen, Lanius, McNary, Payne, and Putnam, hand-selected people they thought were quote-unquote experts in treatment of DID and DDNOS, kind of, I guess, uh, elected them to be surveyed. Forty-some-odd were uh, requested for the survey, and 36, well, 38 responded, two were rejected because they fell underneath the nine-year bar. Why am I making a case for five steps? The three steps, as outlined in both the ISSTD guidelines and identified in the 2012 survey, stabilization, trauma work, and then the resolution. The three steps they've made are very focused on external behaviors, and that's fair. It's psychology. So mainly it's a science of external behavior. They may work with the thought processes that cause the external behavior, but because they're a science, they work with observable stuff. And so mainly they're concerned not necessarily with what you're thinking so much as what your thoughts are making you do. Working on external behaviors is fair, but they don't work at all, or only as much as absolutely necessary, on internal behaviors. In the three stages, they're working with internal communication and being in contact with each other, but they're not necessarily working on internal community. There's a difference between communication and community, even though they have the same prefix. Communication is just, are we talking? Community is, are we supporting each other? So to come to internal communication in the stabilization phase is insufficient. A therapist sees the client and is mainly concerned with reported behaviors from the client between sessions and with the client's behavior in the session. But what's going on in between the sessions when doing the trauma work, which is phase two, is typically you do the work in the session, an hour, two hours, you do the work in the session, and now there are all these hours between appointments. Even if the appointments are three times a week, there's still a couple of days between appointments in which the client is left alone with their thoughts, with their internal community, or lack thereof. So what's to say that when they leave, things are okay? Only what the client reports back to the therapist. What if the therapist prioritized making sure things would be better in between appointments? So instead of just stabilization, and they do coping mechanisms and affect regulation or emotional regulation work and 
they do work on internal communication, etc. But what if there was actually a phase where it was solely the work to ensure that the client would be okay in between working with trauma? 100% just, are you going to be okay? Establishing supports, not external supports. They can't be there 24-7, 365. You need support that's going to be there all the time. And it's always been with you as a plural. It's always been with you. You know, ever since you were five years old, you've had this internal support system. They may not have had a playbook. They may not have had good role models. They may not have had agreements that were explicit and written down, but they were there and they were trying to cover for each other. So what if you renewed that agreement and made it a solid agreement that everybody would support each other? So in therapy, there's a trauma work, trauma that's being worked on. And when the client leaves, they already have caregivers ready. They have somebody ready to switch to front if that person who's working on their trauma is not able to handle things. So let's say it's the host, or if the host is falling apart, there's another person ready to take over front and abide by the rules and the agreements and keep life going and be able to still hold down a job or whatever is going on, school, job, or family life, taking care of the kids, you know, and things like that. What if there were somebody who was ready to step in and take care of all those things, who you know, the more they have community, the more they have communication, the more they have shared memories and stuff up front. And I'm not saying the traumas won't interfere with this, but there should be a strong group, not everybody, but a strong group that can take control and continue to run life and comfort each other and be there for each other and catch each other when they fall and shore each other up, which means not hard boundaries, but good permeable boundaries between the residents, just like permeable boundaries with the outside world, permeable boundaries between the residents, agreements, and enough, I guess, willpower and strength, enough empowerment within this group that they're able to run things. At the same time, there's many therapists who are, let's say, overstepping client boundaries. And one of the ways to know they're not is if they're handing you your power. And I think maybe this this step, I'm granting that stabilization needs to take place before empowerment. So I'm saying stage one in my proposal is stabilization and stage two and three are internal community and empowerment steps. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I'm saying that those are the two steps that are missing and then they take place, alternating take place at the same time. And then we go to step four, which is the trauma work, and then on to the resolution. So I'm keeping the three steps from the ISSTD guidelines, but I'm adding in those two steps so that clients have more power to both throttle their trauma work and to stabilize their system on their own between appointments. So the industry has been changing. They went from completely pathologizing plurality, that in and of itself being plural is wrong, to slowly, grudgingly accepting the possibility that maybe a client could live plural the rest of their life. They still think of it as being hobbled or dragging around a ball and chain, but they're giving more and more mm, acceptance, maybe, to the idea that we could live this way the rest of our lives. One of the reasons that we think it's entirely acceptable to be plural the rest of your life is because we see DID as a syndrome, not as a disorder in and of itself, but as a syndrome, which means it's a few different things that when they get together, they kind of synergistically make make a issue of their own. We see DID as a syndrome of CPTSD and having a lot of people in your head or a lot of entities in your head. The problem becomes normal people problems, If you were thrown into a house with a bunch of roommates you didn't choose and nobody had any rules, everybody was running amok doing whatever they wanted, somebody would take the keys to the car and drive off with the car, somebody else would leave the dishes in the sink and not wash them, it would be irritating. You'd start getting upset and eventually you'd lose your temper and you'd get really mad at everybody that you live with. 
and you demand better behavior from them. And of course, they wouldn't want it because you're demanding and, and so on. Then we get into choice theory versus coercion and stuff like that. So, so that's like one layer of the problem. That's just the people problem. That's a problem anybody internal or outside, would have with a bunch of people thrown together in a living situation without rules and with bad communication skills and stuff. Then we add to that complication the CPTSD. And what that means is, in terms of being plural, is that many layers of this group have PTSD or CPTSD in their own right. So not only do you have a bunch of roommates and housemates who are living together in a lawless environment with no good role models and poor communication skills, but many or maybe most have at least PTSD to muck up the works. So not only are people leaving the dishes in the sink, they're also having temper tantrums, they're looping, they're having flashbacks, they're basically falling apart. It's, it's a picture if like a veterans administration was just basically a bunch of veterans thrown into a place tripping on each other's triggers and setting each other off. And it, it would be a mess. It would be a mess in any environment, much less sharing a body. We separate the people problems from the CPTSD. If you look at DID as a syndrome, it's many people plus CPTSD. So one of the things that we consider this to be is we can handle the people problems separately from the CPTSD problems. We can separate them out. Not entirely because the CPTSD informs the people. The people are affected deeply, obviously, by CPTSD, but those who are less affected by it can make a good, solid core group to start with and work together and start building community and invite the others who have more PTSD and more are, are more stuck in the there and then rather than the here and now they can set a foundation that's attractive to those people to give them motivation to try to break out of their PTSD or give them something to come to when they do. So there's this core group who has established safety and security and is basically holding the fort. And that can be a core group of one if necessary. If, if you can find at least one person who can say, okay, you know, these are the rules, I'm going to try and enforce them. Then from there, once you have that core stable group, the folk with less trauma issues who are ready to work on them can come forward, maybe resolve some of that trauma so that they can gen then become new members of that core group. There's a big process to it that we have all over our website. There may be plenty of other ways of doing it, but that's how we do it. We establish a good group and then we make it so attractive other people want to join in and then they help them. They help them on board. They help them between the trauma work. They help them adjust. They help them come on board. They help them contribute, uh, feel like valued members of the system, and so on. So as more and more come online, the core group gets stronger and is more able to enforce the rules that they've all agreed on. Every time we onboard somebody, we talk about having them look over the rules and decide whether anything needs to be changed and bring changes to the core group and say, hey, you know, in order for me to be able to sign this, I'd really like this to change and they can all consider it and work it out, make it a win-win. Or, you know, I need this rule removed. So they discuss it as long as, as everybody is happy with whatever the rules end up being at the end. It's all good. And anything else they have to work out, compromises and win-win situations and so on, and try and massage the rules until everybody's okay with them. It's kind of like a collective culture where everybody is contributing to what the culture is going to become and what the values of the group is and things like that. So one of the problems with the industry changing to accepting plurality more and more is that it's not well documented. There's a lot of bias in the ISSTD guidelines. Speculation, a lot of supposition, a lot of shooting, a lot of reinforcing what we consider to be stigma and preconceived notions about plurality without the respect of realizing we would actually be able to read these things, you know, and, and be like, uh, guys, you know, you're not being nice here. Did you think we couldn't read? You know, you put this on the web. And it's basically a cornerstone of the whole industry. 
So those 90% of therapists who don't know what they're doing are potentially going to read this document and come out on the other side thinking that the experts are telling them all this dogma about who and what we are and how they should behave towards us. And as the experts are moving more and more towards accepting plurality, the document is frozen in time and has all this bias in it. So all the new therapists are being indoctrinated, if you will, by a document that is biased and not friendly to accepting plurality. So the quick overview of the three current steps, we have stabilization, that's kind of an anchor step, and it's returned to frequently throughout therapy. But stabilization, it's establishing basic safety, emotional regulation, coping mechanisms, building rapport with the therapist, and fostering some internal communication and cooperation. Trauma work, CPTSD work, the work on getting the plural unstuck from the there and then into the here and now. And the final phase is resolution where either the preferred path, according to the ISDS-TD 2011 guidelines, the preferred path is unification and trying to get the alters to merge. But the 2012 survey says the experts actually do that less as they're finding that it's not working as well. There's a whole bunch of supposition as to why that happens, because some of them are working in hospital environments, and there may be a selection bias in the clients they're working with, and they all basically hang out in the same group and have the same ideas and the same philosophies or share their ideas and philosophies with each other. It's possible that just this group is becoming more and more progressively accepting or grudgingly accepting of plurality, or maybe they're seeing that this is a much more successful path for the clients. Maybe they actually have our best interests at heart and are seeing that we are happier in the long run this way. It's very discouraging to go through unification and go through all of that work to celebrate the the return, quote unquote, I mean, I'm going to put quotes around return because I've never been a singular person to my knowledge, but the return to singularity, uh, if, if one wants to call it that, there's a lot of documentation to say that, that people never came together in the first place. So they celebrate unification only to have it fall apart again, or to find out there was somebody else that they had not known about hiding another stowaway, hiding someplace. So now they're plural again, or a new trauma happens and they fall apart into their old coping mechanisms. Because, and I've, I've heard this said somewhere, and it's a very interesting statement, and I don't remember who said it, the strength of the unification has to be stronger than any trauma that comes after it. Or the strength of the new coping mechanisms need to be sufficient to handle any new trauma that happens. If the glue holding everybody together is not stronger than any new impacts, they will fall apart. Or if the coping mechanisms aren't able to handle a situation, the situation just defies the new coping mechanisms that they've come up with, they will fall back to the old patterns and handle it as a team. I'm not seeing a big problem with that, but it can be very discouraging after you jump through all of these hoops, your therapist is happy, they get another notch in their belt for ha having unified yet another system, so they're happy, you've pleased your therapist, you think now life is going to be so much easier, which is not necessarily true, you know, it's like I've cured this, I'm done. The industry thinks that falling apart again after unification is a failure on part of the therapist, believe it or not. It actually blames the therapist. And if it achieves unification, it lauds the therapist. That's kind of like a doctor who sets a bone getting cheered on because it healed well. It's very weird. You know, if you, if you take a broken bone and you set it do you get a notch in your belt for that? You know, because that's really all the doctor did, right? They took some x-rays, they anal analyzed the x-rays, they fixed the alignment of the bone, but who did the healing? Who put the things back together? It wasn't the therapist. You know, the therapist doesn't unify the client. The client unifies the client. So it's a very weird thinking that they kind of stand around and applaud or there's kind of this like, 
idea that there's an award for having unified more clients. You know, you've conquered the wild multiple. You, you have forced upon them singularity and made them more like us. So we're going to reward you. And the, so the, the therapist and the treatment therapy itself, the therapist and the plan are given the credit for unification when really they probably have very little to do with it because we do have spontaneous merges. Let's, let's put it this another way. If the natural state of the human being were to be singular and plurality not, should the human be healed of all trauma, they should naturally, spontaneously merge to be unified. There should be no need to do it as a process, a ritual, a, a plan, and so on. It should be back to homeostasis. If homeostasis is that one body, one mind, then if all of the problems are taken care of, according to science, according to homeostasis and, and all these theories, if this is the natural resting state of the human being, then upon the healing, it should return back to homeostasis. I, and if it needs coercion or not coercion, if it needs a push, if it needs a gentle push with consent, if it needs a little gentle tap in order to make it all fall into place, kind of like one might set a bone so that then it can heal aligned properly. Where's the celebration in that? So you tap it, you know, and it falls back into place. And then over time it merges. Who's doing the merging? It's not the therapist. The therapist did maybe a little bit, maybe encouraged it, unless it's a coercive process. So this three-step model, stabilization, trauma, resolution, this three-step model has some shortfalls. There are times that a client is going to walk into the therapist's office and they're going to seem to have their shit together. They have a good job, pay their bills on time, they're raising a family, they've got stuff together, they haven't been falling apart, they came in for whatever reason, looking for a tune-up, whatever, you know, they find out, okay, you know, you seem to have DID, you're losing time, this, that, and the other thing, but nothing's really falling apart in your life. You seem pretty stable, you're not self-harming, you're not smoking, <laughs> you know, you could use some help with this, that, or the other thing, but all right, let's start a couple of weeks of stabilization, but let's start working on trauma. The stabilization is done. If it's the second step, what happens if that first step is done already? Many therapists are going to overlook the rapport that's supposed to be part of stabilization. In the case of a person walking into their office who's already quote unquote stable, and the fact that it's a three step model rather than more, there's not an actual full step for building rapport. So they're not going to check it off in their mental checklist. They're going to say, oh, this client is stable, stable enough. Like, okay, we can proceed to trauma work. What a huge mistake that is. <laughs> so when it's the second step, it encourages trauma work too early. That therapist is going to want to think, and this is bias on their part, but it's, it's a normal human thing. They want to be accomplished. They want to check the little boxes and look at their report card and say, oh, I got an A+. So they're going to overemphasize the amount of stabilization work they've done and accomplished in a very short amount of time and not necessarily be looking for discrete signs that their client is ready to move on to trauma. The other problem is in this model, if you read the ISSTD guidelines, they may mention internal communication, but really the internal communication is more emphasized in the, the brand 2012 survey. So those experts are doing a lot of internal communication work and a lot more cooperation work than the people in the 90%. The 10% are less, because it's probably way less than 10%. The 10% who are familiar with DID and then the subset of them that we would consider experts according to the brand survey, that end of the spectrum isn't the problem. We don't have to worry about those people. We have to worry about the other 90 plus percent of people who don't know what they're doing. Um, and that includes some of the 10% who think they're familiar with DID. So those people who are looking to these 2011 guidelines and missing that there's an emphasis on internal communication, some of them are really blundering 
very seriously. We get a lot of complaints in the DID community about really bad practices from many therapists, bordering on what I would consider to be malpractice, insisting on only talking to one person in the system. That goes completely against 2012 brand. Insisting that if they dissociate, or rather conflating dissociation with switching. So if they switch in therapy, they're actually getting punished, sometimes being told that they can no longer work with therapist. So they're getting kicked out of therapy. I mean, the, the list of atrocities just continues on and on. Maybe they're doing the client a favor if they're so incompetent and so unfamiliar with DID and kicking them out of therapy. Maybe they're doing them a favor. But to fool themselves that they work with DID and to put it out there in the world that they work with DID when they're doing those really awful practices, that means they're part of the 10% who claims to know what they're doing, but they're actually in the abuse category. So that de-emphasis on internal communication and cooperation and having no faith whatsoever in the internal system to take care of itself, to take care of its own, and how it translates to really poor therapy habits. The three-step model tends to leave the client feeling shamed and helpless. It's not about their comfort. It's not about their happiness. It's not about, it's not about emotional integrity. What happens is you barely get stable and now you're moving on to trauma. So now you're reliving disempowerment. You walk into the therapist's office feeling disempowered already. You're already feeling disempowered because of the doctor knows best culture around therapy and and stuff. So you walk into the office feeling disempowered, but you also probably felt disempowered before you even considered going to the therapist's office. So life has been disempowered. Therapy is disempowered. Now you're working on trauma, already disempowered twice, disempowered in life, just in general, even as an adult, and then disempowered in therapy. And now you're working on trauma and you're being buffeted and pounded by memories and, and flashbacks with no, with no emotional solidity to your life, with no foundation to work from. It's like raising a chicken in space or, you know, a bird in space and saying, hey, fly, go ahead and fly. But there's nowhere to kick off from. There's no, there's no nest. There's no branch. Like, how am I going to fly? There's nothing to kick off of. I'm just floating around in space. You know, so the, the person is floating in this place with no ground whatsoever. No matter how much the stabilization step says to work on grounding, grounding is kind of a, a both a misnomer and a false grail, if you will. There's a lot more to getting into the here and now and being present in your body or present at least in the room than quote unquote grounding. And so it, it should be much more elaborated on as well. But that's a different discussion. So the client comes into the therapist's office shamed and helpless, leaves every single trauma sh- session feeling shamed and helpless. It's just, it's a pounding of disempowerment. So part of the shortfall of the three-step method is that the client already had poor boundaries and already was disempowered and is just continually feeling that way throughout the rest of therapy. Without a discrete step, being dedicated to empowerment and it being on the shoulders of the therapist to make sure of it, like check all the boxes, you know, but without the therapist being 100% held accountable to empowering the client, empowerment won't happen. I'm going to talk more about the five steps and what I'm proposing. Stabilization, let's still do stabilization. Stabilization is great, not knocking stabilization. In stabilization, we work on the basic safety issues, crisis handling, self-care, emotional regulation, like panic relief, lowering distress, and relaxing the amnesiac barriers within the system. So that's kind of a bridge there because it is working on internal processes. But to do that, I would recommend actually working with the internal landscape as well as inner world. Work with the internal imagery. See, it's not really imagery because it's persistent, but the internal world. Coping mechanisms and rudimentary skills for coping and other rudimentary life skills to make sure that 
like the bills get paid or appointments get kept. Fostering internal communication and cooperation, that should start right away as early as possible, but we'll take it to the next step next. And then building rapport is a main, whatever main process within the stabilization step is building rapport. And that can't be emphasized enough, but because I'm adding two more stages, you now have more time to build rapport in the cases where somebody who's already pretty stable walks into the office. So you don't have to stay stuck in the stabilization phase waiting to build rapport. You can actually move on to the next two steps and do those simultaneously while still building rapport. And in fact, I think empowering the client is going to be a game changer in terms of building rapport. Step two takes place at the same time as step three, kind of alternating between them or working in concert with each other. But step two is kind of mentioned in the brand 2012 survey, and it's not a formalized step. Building internal trust and community is leaning into and leveraging the elaborate network that the client already has inside so that you can create a 24-7, 365 response team environment. When you have good boundaries between them, when one is working on trauma, the others can be on standby to help them out. Notably, this group has worked as a team before, whether they knew it or not. Even on a subconscious level, they've already worked as a team. They have protectors, they have healers and, and carers, they have the trauma holders, they have the people who hold the good stuff, you know, and so on. They've already worked as a team, even in the divvying up of responsibilities and memories and things like that as children. They may have gone through a phase of forgetting that each other exists, or maybe they never really knew consciously that each other exists, but they can find each other and work out a new team with more mature roles and more explicit roles, more directly strategized rather than just reflexive. So why would they do this? If this team, if the people inside the system can't have trust or rapport internally, they will have a lot of trouble with having external rapport and trust too. There's a lot of correlation between the inner world and the inner workings and how this group, the collective, collaborative, this plural, will deal with the external world. There's a lot of transfer of skills. There's a lot of transfer of culture and a lot of transfer of expectations, especially around trust. So the more trustworthy they find each other, the easier it'll be for them to trust people outside too. And the more protected they'll be if something does happen externally that they need to defend themselves from. If they're working together and they collaborate together and so on, they will have each other's back. They will be watching out for each other. This one may be really good at spotting emotional manipulation. And that one may be really good at noticing, you know, physical tells of impending violence or whatever. So they all have different skills. Once they're collaborating and working together, they can have each other's back, which is very, very helpful, both for in the therapeutic relationship, protecting themselves from the therapist. Sorry, it's the absolute truth. They have to protect themselves from you, even if they have rapport, even if they have trust. Sometimes you say something, maybe not the right thing to have said. They just have to protect themselves. I'm not saying in a bad way, just like we have emotional boundaries with people we trust all the time. And it's not good to have no boundaries. You have boundaries. It's like, hey, dude, step off. You know, you're you're getting too close to something that you shouldn't be. You can say that to a friend and they won't be offended. They'll be like, oh, sorry. So the same kind of thing with the therapist. Sometimes you just got to say, look, we don't want to go to that trauma today. And maybe you have to say it twice. So they should have boundaries in the therapeutic relationship. They should be in charge of them. We'll talk about that in a moment. If you don't treat their internals with respect? Why should they respect you? So this is interesting. It's like the constant pounding of your parts of the same person is really wearing on that internal trust and the rapport. The guidelines say to treat people the way they want to be treated, basically. But then it also says only up to a point, because in no way do you want to acknowledge that these are actually separate people. I find that really absurd. 
if we walk into your office 100% assured that we're people and you don't want to call us people, you injure the relationship with the therapist every single time. You insist on calling us parts or telling us we're parts of one person in spite of our assertion that we're different people. You hurt the relationship and you break rapport. So maybe that's bias in the ISSTD guidelines and not actually something you should follow. Because in no way would your treating us disrespectfully result in us trusting or respecting you. It wouldn't happen externally with you and another person if somebody kept insisting that you were a lousy doctor. (laughs) Would you really like respect them if they kept on poking at you and saying, you know, you're not that good of a doctor. You know, you're not that good of a doctor. You know, it's like, no, you'd be like, go away. (laughs) If you don't want to erode the relationship between you and your client, don't enforce culture and ideas and and labels and things on them that they don't bring to you themselves. Internal community and trust. So with regard to working with your client and their system, always keep in mind control theory versus choice theory. This was William Glasser's work. You're going to get much, much further by giving the client choices than by trying to coerce them into doing things. With the the building of their internal community, with requesting a head map from them, all of these things, you can suggest to a client to make a head map and you could say, hey, you know, if you would like to, I would like to see it. These are people who have not been given choices in the past. So give them choice, give them control. We'll talk more about that in the, the Empower the Client step. Asking a bunch of people who have been hurt over and over again to find physical comfort with physical people over internal comfort from internal people is not going to work. External people can fail them. And you can, you can sit there in therapy and watch it happen as the client reports back to you. I tried to tell my friend and my friend no longer wants to talk to me. My friend saw a split in glass. They think I'm a monster now. They've cut me off. There's no way that telling them they should have found external supports, that they, they should talk to friends or family, that they should go out and, and find external people to rely on for comfort and support between sessions. Don't try and convince them of that. It's, it is going to be a wonderful thing to find really good friends once they're ready. That's their choice. Once they have a really good internal team, then they can turn around and start trusting externals because if an external is an asshole, they'll have their inner circle really solid. So the successive rings of the onion, if you will, of the of their support systems will not necessarily knock them for a loop. I mean, it'll still make them sad or angry or or whatever. They'll have a reaction to it. But if their internal group is really solid and supports each other really well, those losses, those potential losses, their wife divorces them or whatever, it's like once they have that inner stability and know how to monitor it and keep good boundaries, both internally and externally, those external issues shouldn't impact the system as badly as they would have when they had holy boundaries or missing boundaries, when they didn't have internal communication, when they didn't have that internal layer of support and and teamwork. It's kind of like self-esteem for a singular person or self, a sense of self-worth. If you lose a friend, you're okay. You know, you may be sad, you may be mad, you, you may resent it, but you as a person, as, as an entity are okay you have other friends to lean on. You have other relationships. Well, the same thing for a plural, but given, given our experiences with the world, it's really reasonable to have that really, really trusted inner team that we can absolutely rely on. The other reason to have the internal community and trust building is to basically prevent newbie therapists and inexperienced therapists from rushing into trauma therapy, and it will help emphasize the importance of internal communication and cooperation in the process so they don't miss it. They won't skip that step uh, in, in rushing to the 
voyeuristic, uh, let's hear about the, you know, the dirt step. <laughs> so you might be thinking, well, won't this encourage that narcissistic investment in the altars if they work on internal community and trust as a whole step in and of itself? Realistically, given that most cases, merging and or unification is either not achieved at all or it falls apart again, it's really likely your client is going to remain plural for the rest of their life, no matter what you want. It doesn't matter what the quote unquote experts in the industry who wrote the ISSTD guidelines think about this. It doesn't matter what Clough wrote in 1993 or whatever it was about narcissistic investment. It does not matter. We should have an internal investment as a self-protective mechanism that ensures our survival as a group. It's not detrimental to external relationships. So it can't be called narcissistic. It doesn't mean that we're going to sabotage external relationships in favor of our internal relationships. It doesn't mean we're going to divorce our wife because we like the people in our head better, unless our wife is really being a pain in the ass about us being plural. You know, if, if they hate it, if they want us to change, if, if they're basically being coercive and control, making power games and messing with our head and things like that, but then we should be divorcing her anyway, right? Let's be real here. That's abusive behavior. So I don't think having the quote unquote narcissistic investment in the people we share a body with is the issue. I think it's being biased and it's spread throughout the industry in a very destructive way. Very, very destructive. So every single one of those 90% plus, because probably the other 10% also read these guidelines. So anybody who reads those guidelines is going to read statements like that and they're going to have bias about us getting along inside, about us liking each other. Look, it's not even about like self-love, quote unquote, but even then, the whole new age movement about first you have to love yourself before you can love somebody else and all that kind of stuff. What's the issue with us liking and or loving each other? It should be a narcissistic investment in some ways. I mean, not narcissistic because that's such a hard, hard, dirty word, right? We should be in a loving, compassionate, kind relationship with ourselves. Shouldn't everybody be in a loving, kind, compassionate relationship with themselves, like singular or plural? both internally, like as individuals and internally as a group, shouldn't we be kind and compassionate and like each other and get along and be respectful? Why is there a problem with this? Why is it a problem with us saying, wow, I like these people and I want to continue hanging out with them. I like getting along with them. I like working with them. It's, it's like walking into a business and there are those people who like to climb the ladder and they will destroy the competition on the way up the ladder, right? So there are people in corporations who who do not, and this is narcissistic, they do not care about the competitors. They, they picture everybody as a competitor, and they'll knock them all off, make them quit, make them cry in the bathroom at work. They will step all over people. They will, they will, tr that's narcissism, okay? This is the trashing people on the way to the top. That's narcissism. And so it's, it's offensive to use the word narcissist, especially in a group that has probably been abused by narcissists. Like, it's unthinkable to have tagged us with this, but nope, there it is. It's sitting there in the guidelines. So incredibly biased. This narcissistic investment that's like Clough's favorite, maybe it's not his favorite, but at least in the ISSTD guidelines, it's like pulled into them several times. It's three times that that phrasing is in the ISSTD guidelines. And, and it's rude. It's saying don't like each other. And it means if the therapist sitting on the couch across from me realizes that we actually like each other, they're now automatically biased against that. We're not in this to knock off other people. We're not in this to climb up a ladder to the top and leave a mess in our, in our wake. <laughs> we are in this to survive. This is a survival mechanism. And if being loving and compassionate and kind to each other and liking each other is is going to assist our survival 
because we don't want to hurt our body because we all share it. Duh, how is that a bad thing? (laughs) It's like running around telling people if you like yourself, if you're okay with yourself, that's a narcissistic investment in yourself. You shouldn't do that. It's bad. When would we ever say that to somebody who's singular? We would never say that to somebody who's singular. Either you're a narcissist or you're not. There's no narcissistic investment in yourself. So if you want to run around continually insisting that we're all parts of one person, or if we're a group of people in one body who need to live together and and get along, either way, it serves us to be invested in each other. And the word narcissist does not need to apply. So building this internal support system and, and we mentioned this earlier, working with the willing members of the system and stabilizing those who are in the PTSD area and the CPTSD area, those that are guarded and vulnerable, to help them get a little more stabilized. So actually internally, internalizing the first step and bringing that stabilization into the system and the cooperative group, I'm going to call it the cooperative group working with those who are not able to cooperate yet to help them stabilize. So kind of like having inside agents that help the therapist, inside helpers who help the therapist work with the more tough people in the system and help them build trust and rapport and stuff within the system. They don't have to have trust and rapport with the therapist. They have to have trust and rapport within the system first Later, they may have trust and rapport with the therapist, or maybe that'll be a side effect of it. But it's so much more important to have this going on inside and not worry so much about the relationship with the therapist for for those people. The, The collaborative should have a good relationship with the therapist and trust and rapport with the therapist. But within the system, those who are stuck in PTSD land who are unable to communicate properly, who black out and switch out and things like that, they need to be slowly onboarded to the collaborative. And the first step of that is to stabilize them, just like you stabilized the other people. And then using the internal world as a tool and a technique to help foster communication So if their collaborative group is having trouble communicating with those vulnerable members, those people stuck in the there and then, they can install communication equipment and lines and leave bulletin boards around or chalk and and chalkboards, you know, whatever it is that they need in their system to help foster communication, to leave them kind messages and just things to let them know it's it's 2019. We're safe now. Please come and talk to us. We are having a meeting. You're invited. This constant flow of communication and invitation and, you know, please talk to us. We're looking forward to meeting you in spite of them acting out. So we we have a lot of information about that on our podcast. Actually, we have six episodes on just that three hours. So we don't have time for that now. So using the internal world to foster communication and community, helping them to support each other and stabilizing their inner strengths, working on making this into conscious, mature, and deliberate cooperation. So that collaborative group should be having meetings, you know, things that that resemble what mature people would do. I mean, you, you can have a family meeting, you know, in a household of four people. It doesn't matter how many there are. And it can be run like a corporation. So there could be meetings of a corporation like, hey, we're going to have a meeting every Monday morning, you know, and discuss our week, a weekly meeting having or even a daily meeting to work out what's today's goals, what are the important things we have to remember today, who's going to do what, you know, and so just same things as any other external group of people would do, they can do inside. And eventually, once that cooperative group is good enough, and and maybe even right from the beginning, but it's kind of up to them, they can start working on explicit rules or agreements so that they have the beginning of their own culture, their own legal system, quote unquote, or whatever, their own uh, ways of enforcing rules and so on that they need to be empowered to enforce their rules and so on. So step three is empowering the client. This is never mentioned in either the guidelines or in the survey that we could tell. Having gone over them and looked specifically for it, we have not found it. 
So what is this? It's kind of the missing step in probably in all of therapy, but we're going to start here with DID and OSDD. Because this, this population is so disempowered to begin with, I think it's very, very important that it be mentioned in this community in particular. What is empowering the client? It's giving them agency, confidence, allowing them to define and defend their own boundaries. It's helping the client find their voice. Some clients just can't even speak up for themselves. That, that takes a lot of work, depending on where their trauma came from. And, and to put the trauma first without trying to help them find their voice is, is a danger. I understand the trauma may be in the way of getting their voice. Do minimal trauma work, if necessary, in order to free up the power. Minimal, but only if absolutely necessary, in order to get the power back. Because you as the therapist are in control of the power in the relationship between you and the client when the client walks into the office, you are also in charge of handing that power back to the client. Be patient with it, but make it clear to them what you're doing. That, look, I'm not directing your, your therapy sessions anymore. That's up to you. But feed it to them slowly. Feed them power slowly. What time would you like your session to be? I have these slots available. This, this, and this. Which one would you like? Anything, anything where you can hand them control and power, do it. <laughs> Any little thing, let them start determining when their sessions will be. Let them d determine how long the sessions will be or what location they'll be in, if you have more than one location. Let them determine what's next to work on. Let them own and control their collective life and destiny. So talk to them about treatment options. Talk to them about the treatment plan. It's not your plan. It's their plan. So have them help you work on their plan. Allow them to own and control their recovery. Where do they want to go? What do they want to do? How do they want their life to be? What, is, what would a perfect life look like for them? And you can ask questions to help pull this out of them, but don't control the conversation. Now, why do we do this? Until the client is empowered, there's a tremendous risk of accidental or deliberate therapy abuse. If the client's very laissez-faire about what trauma is next to work on, and you're picking it, then you may pick one that's going to send them into a hospital. I mean, you, you could be picking a trauma that is just too much for them to handle. And they may be like, okay, because they don't have any power. They've already handed it all over to you. You have to refuse it. You have to have a boundary between you and them and not accept their power. Do not accept it. Have a complete boundary there. Nope, sorry, that's, that's for you to decide. Nope, sorry, that's for you to decide. Nope, sorry, that's for you to decide. And you can help them make the decision. I'm not saying to let them flounder in their helplessness. And you can role model good decision making and you can help them learn how to strategize. Your job is a facilitator or a coach for doing this. But holding too much of the power in the relationship runs at a huge risk for that client. Making sure they have the power reinforces that boundary it has the wonderful side effect of helping with transference. It also helps the client system work toward adult functionality. If they come to you and they say, you know, well, today our little wants to talk to you. It's like, oh, okay, sure. And if the little comes out and talks to you, great. You know, it's like, that's fine. But it should be their decision as a group to decide what we're working on today in therapy, who wants to be in the session, what trauma is next. So during the, the internal community and trust phase, continue to hand the power to the client. So that's why these take place simultaneously. So as they're working on internal community building, hand them more and more of their power. And I'm doing it as an explicit step because it's just so important that we can't afford for that 90% of people reading the guidelines to skip it. We want them to make sure this is on their checklist and that it's a very discreet step. So this empowerment starts from inside of the client system. As they're working on building internal trust in community and they're seeing things starting to fall into place and work, they're going to feel more and more empowered within their community. And that's great. It's your job to also help them feel more empowered outside of that. 
working on external boundaries, working on having more power both in the therapy session and once they step out onto the sidewalk outside, feeling more empowered. It, it's like practice it inside of the therapeutic relationship so that they can transfer that skill to the outside world. But first start them, start them off practicing it internally in their internal community. So internal community, therapeutic relationship, external, outside of both the therapeutic relationship and their internal world. And then the trauma work in the control of the client, because of the torment, that, that potential torment, it can damage the therapeutic relationship if you push too hard or you choose the wrong trauma if you hold the reins. If they hold the reins, I mean, I'm not saying it's good if, if they throw themselves into a tizzy or if they decompensate or break down or are abreacting all week and things like that. But that won't hurt the therapeutic relationship if they chose it, if you understand what I'm saying. You won't break rapport and trust the same way because you didn't choose it. They chose it. They may break their own internal trust and you may have to help them work on that. They need to know they can throttle it. If they start a, a trauma work session and change their mind or they're seeing things going awry, they can stop. So make sure they have the power to stop. Part of this exercise is a trust exercise on part of the therapist. Trust the client's healing process. Trust the client group to take care of themselves. They've been at this a long time, way longer than they've known you. They've been at this taking care of each other thing. And it may have definitely been rough and certainly unconscious. And they're working on making it conscious and deliberate and, and mature with you. You know, you're there as a consultant to them. They've been at this a long time. They're the experts in their own system, whether they realize it or not, making sure that they know it and that they know they can trust their gut instincts and they can trust each other once they get around any of the problems with trust, that they can potentially trust each other. It's transferring your trust of them to own their own process. That also empowers them. Be somebody in their life who trusts them. So work in the role of a consultant. Trust them to be the experts in their own system. It's like you're a business consultant and they're in the business of living their life. They're a group entity. This group goes to you and says, we need some help working out our life. And you're there as a an consultant to help them learn how to operate their life better. Just like um, any business calls in a consultant to do team building work or trust building work or uh, strategy to help them work on strategies and skills and trainings and things like that. You're there as a trainer, a consultant for their internal business. Their internal business is a mess. They, they hire the expert to come in and help them fix it. You know, there are people who do this. There are experts that do this in businesses. The business is falling apart. They hire somebody who comes in and like power manages everything and fixes all these processes, but everybody has to be on board. Everybody inside the system and out. So you're in the role of a consultant. You're not doing the work. You're facilitating the work. Also, your trust is a great way to role model trust inside and trust for the external world. So if you role model trust, they can internalize that. So you have rules, have rules for your relationship with this client. Definitely like strict rules and make sure they're explicit. Make the rules with the client. So make sure you both agree. And this way you can use the process of working on rules for the therapeutic relationship to show examples of making compromises and negotiating things. You can have the places where you're like, no, sorry, that's not a negotiable rule. I really need that in place. And there can be other places like, hey, you know, we can work on this one together. We can both compromise on this one. And then how to enforce the rules should be part of the the agreements. You know, each agreement, if if this is broken, this is what happens. And enforce that. So this way you're role modeling in the therapeutic relationship how rules work inside the system as well. You have other options as well, like, like advising and informing and training the client in selves care. You can give full transparency and disclosure of your processes that you're using with them, the treatment plan. The treatment plan should be collaborative because it's theirs, not yours. It's not what you're doing to them. It's the plan for how they're going to get to recovery. 
ultimately the choice of whether and when to start working on trauma. At any point, if the client says no, it means no. If it means stop, stop now, we've had enough for today, then you stop. So then we move to stage four. So now we have an empowered client, or at least a somewhat empowered client. You know, I'm not saying this is a perfect process, but they have a, a pretty good internal community going. You trust them to know when to say no and when to start, you know, doing stuff and, and throttling the process. And, and they have their power. So you've negotiated rules and agreements in your therapeutic environment with the client that say, you decide these things. I decide these things. We decide these things together, you know, and so on. So the CPTSD work, I'm not going to call it trauma work because there's so much nuance to CPTSD that I think it should be the name of the step. P CPTSD work, it's really partially the trauma work, but also it may involve more nuances and skills for emotional regulation and stuff, especially while you're working through the trauma to uh, help them work together and so on. So working on the CPTSD and the PTSD at this point, it only proceeds in this stage if and as the client asks for it. I mean, really, at the point you get to internal community and empowerment, if the client says, you know what, I want to go and live my life for a couple of years. Let's move to maintenance and not do the trauma. Let's just not do the trauma now. I'm not ready. I, I need to go out and work and take care of my kids and blah, blah, blah. And I feel like I'm in a pretty good place now. Then trauma therapy does not happen. If at that point they are stable enough they are in control of the stuff in their head and they are empowered. They do not need to proceed to trauma work. This is the client's choice, 100% client choice. Trauma work can wait 10, 20, 30 years. It does not have to take place while they're raising small children. It does not have to take place while they're newly married or any other stresses in their life or while they're even like working full time or switching jobs or moving locations. Yeah, you may lose the client. You're going to have to trust the client to know what they want. And so they they get a break, an adrenal, like body physical break through this process. If they need it, they can handle daily life. They can bring issues to you without getting completely rocking their world in between sessions with the trauma. That is their choice. So basically you can just be a support for normal issues that anybody might bring to therapy. Oh, I was having some problems with my kids. I could use a little bit of help with parenting ideas. I'm having trouble handling my kid uh, yelling at me. How can I handle that better? You know, normal stuff, therapy stuff, right? So you can help them handle that as a plural, as a multiple system. So basically at this point, if it could be, it could be healthy multiplicity, quote unquote. Do they still have trauma? Yes. Are they still going to have trauma reactions? Yes, occasionally they will. Will they be able to cope with it? Probably, but they always have the option to walk into therapy and say, you know what? I had this really bad trigger the other day. Can we work on that? They always have that option. So at any point, the client can say, you know, I just want to live my life. And then at any other point, they could come in and say, look, I really need to work on this. This is getting in the way of me living. So this way, they only work on the traumas they're ready, when they're ready, and otherwise they're allowed to just live a life. They could have a whole life. It could be 10, 20, or 30 years between this point and that point. It means that the 6 to 12 years of getting the diagnosis plus, mm, you know, however, however long it takes to get to this point where they have an internal community and they feel empowered is so much less then the you have to get to this holy grail of healthy multiplicity on the other side of your trauma work. So let them have a life if that's what they want. If they want to dive into PTSD work, great, do it, but only do it on their schedule. So you proceed if the client asks for it. The client owns and throttles the process, what to work on, when to work on it, when to stop and rest or when to handle like other issues in the here and now, like my kid is yelling at me, my kid refuses to do his homework, it's driving me nuts. As the therapist, your role is maintaining the safe environment, providing mirroring and observations, 
to help that client make decisions. You can, you can point out if you think the client's in denial, you can, you know, say, Hey, do you really think that's true? If their reality testing is off, you can, you can encourage them. Hey, you know, I think, I think you're having some trouble telling, you know, what's really going on. So let's talk about this. If you, if you want to, we can talk about reality testing and, and make sure that you remember how that works. We did this in step one, but maybe we need to go back to that. You know, you can offer as a consultant, you can offer assistance, you can point out problems and you can encourage them. Hey, you know, I suggest this. I think we should that and give them choices. Choice theory all the way. Proud supporter of William Glasser's work. So monitor them for distress. If you see them come into the office and they're showing some signs, let them know. Suggest breaks and other perspectives and help them choose the traumas that they think they can handle if they really, really want to plow through the trauma work. Make sure that you think they're making wise choices, that that the traumas they're going to work on will have a positive effect to work on. Don't go for the sensationalism or the things that are going to even scare you and give you nightmares. Don't go for those unless that's what they want. Go for the little things that are like daily annoyances. Like I had a coffee trigger. That's annoying. You know, those are problems. Work on those niggling things that are constant annoyances, that are constant triggers that that wear down uh, their emotional resiliency. Another thing to continue doing during the CPTSD work is to continue revisiting steps one, two, or three with skills and reinforcement of internal community issues or reinforcing empowerment as needed throughout this step. And that brings us to resolution, which can have two different end goals, really. Again, has to be client-led. So they can go for functional or healthy multiplicity, working together with internal roles. Okay, so at this point, you as the consultant, (laughs) if you will, works on their internal roles and trust and building community yet more, you know, with the goal of independence, setting goals, plans, strategies, skill building for life skills, like how to do laundry or whatever, career, business, if they desire career business goals or what to study or what school to go to and things like that. So this would be kind of planning their next steps. Like if therapy were to end, what what would be next? Handling the issues of remaining more and more in the here and now as a group. As there's less trauma, there's possibly more presence, more being in the here and now and less dissociation. So how do we handle that? How do we handle pain? How do we handle being present in the room or on the phone? How do we handle boredom? Like whatever it is. And during this, even during functional multiplicity, working towards being a group, the client can always decide to attempt to deliberately merge alters. And of course, anywhere in the whole process, any step, there can be spontaneous merges as well. So they may work towards unification. They may say, you know, we were heading for functional multiplicity, but as we're talking about it, we've decided to try unification. Even though they had an internal community does not mean that they're narcissistically invested and resistant to unification. <laughs> then there's, of course, if, if this is the goal of the client, there's unification. So unification, the client has to have the option to stop at any time and decide to switch to functional multiplicity, just like somebody working towards functional multiplicity could change their mind. If the client has the power, the client has the power of changing their mind without pressure from the therapist. Working on the internal roles and trust and community building and then merging their internals that desire to be merged and then working on handling external life skills and issues as a singular person because they may never have been singular before. So how do we handle life as a singular person? And then the other step of resolution, regardless of the path chosen, is the life affirming work. So like we mentioned, you know, the goals, the plans, the strategies, the skill building, and the maintenance, going into maintenance mode. 
So one of the things we want to call for is a change in the new ISSTD guidelines to propose certain changes to it. Since this is an industry standard document, I think that the people who author it need to take more responsibility to make it less of a research paper and more of an instructional booklet. Right now, it is extremely difficult for people to read, especially people who are not native English speakers or not trained in psychology in English. So it is very difficult to read, very difficult to implement because it's, it's conversational and not instructional. So a more readable, international-friendly document with easier language rather than a discussion format, an actual procedural format with headlines and subheadings, bullet lists, glossary of terms, a table of contents would be good, maybe even an index. <laughs> and I think that this can really shorten the document, believe it or not. I know it sounds like it would make it longer, but because there's so much inherent discussion in the document, where it reads much more like a very, very long research paper rather than an instructional document, I think it could really be made shorter. And that would also ease its use in a practical situation. Now, due to the industry and worldwide stigma about DID, how to address the plural client really has to be spelled out and clarified. The industry experts in the brand 2011 guidelines noted that all 36 work with alters, work with alter states or individuals within the plural system right from the start of therapy. Nobody says, I'm sorry, it's too soon. I can't talk to you. I only want to talk to the host. But in practice, out in the field, that's what's happening. There are people who are refusing to work with people who switch or who will think the host is the quote unquote real or core or original. All these types of things that are leftovers from many years of bad movies, bad stigma. Um, and, you know, frankly, I, I'm still appalled that there are um, reference materials in reference lists that are, you know, 30 years old. It's, it's appalling. <laughs> Update everything, please. Use the latest thought, even if it has to be anecdotal. Use the latest thought on how to address the client system and how to deal with their internals, the value of having an internal community rather than just collaboration or not collaboration. What was it? Yeah, I think it's um, internal collaboration, but to actually have a community, like explicit rules, culture, etc., all down the list, a community. And the use of the inner world. There's no mention of the inner world. And yet, you'll find probably of those 36 expert therapists, if, if, if they had been asked on the survey, which they weren't, not only deal with the internals, but they probably also deal with the internal world right from the get-go. Many therapists suggest installing communication equipment or working with the imagery of the internal world to try and alter it to foster internal community, build a safe space, build a meeting room. These are common suggestions. So, or common enough that I would suspect that those 36 so-called experts probably use it as well. So this should be documented. It should be mentioned in this document. And because, the, because of the history of the plural, each system having been repeatedly traumatized, these clients usually have extreme issues around power and control. So they need to have agency, control, the skill to use their agency and control returned to them as part of treatment or therapy. Or it's just another place in which they're disempowered and potentially abused. So the therapeutic environment must be documented to be an empowering the client environment. And the document, the guidelines need to reflect that, including in and of itself setting a good example to change every place it says patient, every place there's bias or stigma against the client in ways that go against conventional knowledge among the experts, the so-called experts. We are the experts, the specialists, the um, seasoned, if you will, the seasoned specialists who are nine plus years in the industry. They know. The specialists in the industry know that we need to have more agency and control, I'm sure. And there's more research needed. So 
to summarize this all up, I'm going to say we really need to research this stuff. We need more research on evidence-based practices. I'm, I know I'm giving my own anecdotal evidence and not evidence-based through studies and stuff like that. We need to have those evidence-based practices. Unfortunately, there may or may not be funding issues regarding those. And unfortunately, it's really on the industry to stop using hearsay and saying this is true. If all of the therapists out there are just winging it, then admit that you're winging it. <laughs> yes, you can come together in rooms and you can share all of this information, but maybe we should be in on that conversation so that we can help you. Because we have been living like this. We talk to hundreds, hundreds if not thousands of us in groups sharing notes on what works for us and what doesn't. So we could tell you, no, sorry, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. You know, some of these things are just simply not helpful that are in the guidelines. It's neither helpful being in the guidelines themselves, the stigma that it produces in our therapists, or when it's actually being used in treatment. And so we need more evidence-based practices. We need to review the basic assumptions of the field to make sure that they're not based on bias, that they're not based on opinion or it's clearly stated when they are. And we have to be very careful about creating the standards around the experiences of a very closed group of professionals with very similar training and experiences. So removing that bias that comes out of that group is very important. If it's not serving the client, it shouldn't be there. If it's serving the therapist and not the client, or if it's, sing if it's singular centric, we are not singular. Basically, we are not, and we may never have been. So to try and quote unquote, return us to being singular or to use singular centric bias against us is not fair until proven. So you may have to go back try and prove the basic assumptions of all of this therapy or all of this therapy is questionable. In the meantime, this is the best we have, so we need it to be updated. And so that's one of the things that we're personally asking for is to please update the ISSTD guidelines so that it serves us in our recovery. It's our recovery. It's not your recovery. It's not your notches in your belt. It's not your prestige. It's not about that. And that's such a toxic idea that our recovery is a tool for your advancement is an entirely different conversation, but please stop using us to advance your prestige within the industry. It is dehumanizing and it is creating a lot of victims in the process. I want to thank everybody. I know that plenty of plurals have listened to this, and I hope this has been helpful for you to walk in and be a more empowered client in your own therapy and hope it helps you. Hope it helps you defend yourself from therapy abuse in some ways or help you to direct your own recovery. And this has been the Chris's. We thank you very much for joining us. You can find us on kinhost.org. You can find our Many Minds in the Issue podcast in many different places, including kinhost.org, and currently it's on Anchor FM, iTunes, and so on. So Many Minds on the Issue is our podcast. We referenced episodes 9 to 14, which is System Trust Issues series within the podcast. We also referenced, but did not mention the name of the United Front Boot Camp which is our process of helping people build internal community. And we also have the book series currently in progress on Lean Pub, which is called the United Front Bundle, United Front Recruits, United Front Rebels, and United Front Adventurers. And that three-part series is all about building internal community, working with the non-co-conscious rebels within the system, and then taking all of us on adventures in external life and how to cope all from the point of view of being a life coach, just helping people live into their life. So this has been Achieving Healthy Multiplicity and take good care of yourselves.